Uh, Yuma, Guruburi, good morning everyone. My name is Russell Storer and I'm the head curator of international art at the National Gallery of Australia. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the National Gallery for this conversation to celebrate the opening of Jordan Wolfson's solo exhibition, Body Sculpture, which opens today in galleries 16 and 18. And a special welcome to audiences across the country who are joining us online this morning. This conversation is being held on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples from the Canberra region, which is why this, this morning I welcome you with the Ngunnawal greeting, Yuma, and the Ngambri greeting, Guruburi. I thank the Ngunnawal and Ngambri elders who have generously shared their languages with us. I acknowledge them as traditional owners of the lands of the Canberra region where the National Gallery stands. The National Gallery is committed to ensuring First Nations art, artists and culture are at the heart of the national cultural agenda. We are custodians of the world's largest collection of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art, comprising over 7,500 works, and we're committed to building and maintaining meaningful relationships with First Nations peoples, artists, communities, and cultures. And so this morning, I also extend this respect to First Nations elders, artists, and communities across Australia. Jordan Wolfson Body Sculpture is the first solo presentation of Wolfson's work in Australia and the world premiere of Body Sculpture, a major acquisition for the National Gallery collection. This new work combines sculpture and performance to generate emotional and physical responses in the viewer. And if you haven't seen it yet, um, please see our staff and we'll try and accommodate you for the 1pm viewing. Body Sculpture is being shown alongside key works from the National Collection, selected by the Jordan Wolfson. Just to note, the exhibition depicts mature themes and today's discussion may touch on themes including sexual acts, violence and self-harm. Please consider if this conversation is appropriate for you today. It's a great privilege to have Mark Satrakian and Sir Richard Taylor to join us for this conversation this morning. Mark Satrakian is one of the world's leading experts in animatronics and robotics and his career spans nearly four decades of innovation in film, television, theme park attractions, as well as the art world. You've made see Mark's work featured in films including Men in Black, Stranger Things and Pacific Rim, amongst other major productions. Mark specialises in evocative robotic beings that move with uncanny fluidity, existing at the nexus of sound, motion, form and cutting edge technology. Mark has worked closely with Jordan for over five years to realise the artistic vision for body sculpture. Well, he's worked with the artist for 10 years, yes, absolutely, <laughs> on all of, all of Mark's robotic works. Um, joining Mark in conversation is Richard Taylor, the co-founder, creative director and CEO of Weta Workshop, the Aotearoa New Zealand-based concept design and manufacturing facility. Most notably, Weta Workshop led the production of props, costumes and weapons for the Lord of the Rings trilogy. In 2010, Richard was made a Knight Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for his services to film, and he's won five Academy Awards for his work across special makeup effects, costume, and visual effects. Today's conversation will focus on the making of body sculpture, the cutting edge technology that made it possible, and what's next for the future of robotics. Just some housekeeping. Um, we'll welcome your questions through the conversation using Slido and the online Q&A platform. And if you're at home, you can submit your questions below the video on the gallery's website. In the theatre, please ensure that your phone is turned to silent and using the gallery's free Wi-Fi, head to slido.com and enter the code Wolfson. Please join me in welcoming Mark Satrakian and Sir Richard Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I've had the great pleasure of knowing this gentleman sitting next to me for the past 30 years. I first met him when he was working at Rick Baker's workshop, one of the most prestigious effects workshops in the world. And Mark very kindly shared some time with me, showed me some of the animatronic work that he was building. It was evident at that early meeting that I'd had the privilege of engaging with someone that would go on to inspire not only mine but many people's careers. Uh, I've often uh, turned to Mark's work by way of inspiration. Mark has uh, continued to not only produce things of technical excellence, but also things that have emotionally enriched the work that he does. And uh, because of that connection through to Mark, I have uh, I've felt very privileged for this friendship and therefore to be invited here today 
to talk with Mark and then interact with you all has, uh, is a very important thing for me. I've come over from New Zealand with two of my colleagues uh, to witness uh, Jordan's work. If those of you in the room haven't seen it yet, you're going to see it as I did, uh, raw and for the first time uh, two days ago. Uh, unlike, of course, uh, how Mark has seen it, which is an iterative process of it growing and coming to be. Uh, and I'm thrilled for you all, the fact that you are going to see this astounding piece of work. Uh, I thought I'd ask the initial question, which is, uh, why Mark? We ourselves have experienced a reaction when known as a film effects company to having the authority to create fine art for the world. And uh, similarly, I'm sure that Mark has, uh, has found that people at times might wonder why would someone so invested in the film industry consider that they have the authority and desire to enter the fine art arena. And Mark, maybe that would be a lovely place to start. Well, thanks Richard, that's a really hard question. <laughs> um, the, the funny thing about that, actually, if we talk about um, technology versus art, and what is my relationship with art, and what is my relationship with technology. Um, I'm referred to as a roboticist, I'm referred to as a te technologist, but actually I don't really have any true qualifications. I don't have any degrees. Uh, I'm not, I have no formal training in engineering, but what I've been doing um, in, throughout my career, certainly, you know, when I think you and I met, Richard, I was probably 19 or thereabouts, um, the art form that I pursue is motion. It is the expression of emotion and character through... Do you notice that sometimes people look like they're pets? <laughs> that's, a, that's a myth, right? Anyway. But there's, that's, that's actually a good example right there. So I, right on the page. I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> this is a goofy example, but you know, the, the scrunt and I are sharing a moment. And I'm projecting... Um, this, you know, this character into this, into this puppet. That's a microcosm of my career, and everything that I do technologically is in service to that. I have pursued for my entire adult life um, the continuing education of learning the math, learning the code, learning the engineering, learning the materials, embracing new technologies in service of finding better ways to do what I do, and what I do is I paint with motion. And when we think about, um, when I think about what am I building, what am I building, when I build the cube, I'm creating a canvas. I'm stretching my own canvas, I'm mixing my own pigments, I'm making my own paintbrushes, and then I'm using those, those tools to create art. And the art is the motion that I hope you feel when you see something like body sculpture or when you see something like female figure. It's a pretty long-winded answer. No, that's great. Ma Mark, of course, it all starts with a connection, a friendship, a relationship, and in this case, it is one with a, uh, a contemporary American artist, Jordan. Uh, do you want to just share with us, by way of setting the scene, what that origin story is? Sure. Is it one of director and choreographer? Is it one of contemporary dancer? Oh, and that's, yes, so that... Uh, when Jordan and I first met around uh, 2012, he was looking for someone to uh, realize his vision for female figure, um, which was to be an animatronic figure that would dance and lip sync. And when we, when we met, I would say I was, I was keenly interested in working on this project because it was really a departure from film work. It was a departure from the, the work that I usually did. Um, in many ways, and we'll, I, I want to touch on all the different ways that, uh, that it departs from that. But he said uh, that it was going to be a bit like working with a, with a film director. But that wasn't really entirely accurate. Um, the relationship that I have with Jordan, if you sort of imagine the Venn diagram, there's, there's a, a, a large overlap where we are working together, we're, we're talking about the work, we're uh, talking about what is, this, what is this moment in time going to look like? There's things that are really important to me which are very in the weeds technologically that Jordan doesn't really have to be concerned about. But then there's this other area, and this is what I call, uh, you know, Jordan is the, the filter. Jordan is, 
he has a superpower, and there was something that, that uh, Richard just alluded to a minute ago. I can never have the experience of seeing body sculpture for the first time. I can never have the experience of seeing female figure for the first time because it was, it was created in my presence. But Jordan has this thing where he can kind of turn that off and he can reset his perception and see something in a way for the first time. And that gives him the power to, in this, in this section of the Venn diagram, he can, he can evaluate the content that we're creating and say, that's the moment. That's the thing that goes in. That's the thing that will, that will touch upon the, the emotion or the feeling or this, this abstract uh, uh, sensation that we get when we see that moment. We create hundreds of hours of content together and then um, tiny pieces of that find their way into the piece. And that's, that's really how we worked on female figure and, and especially that's how we worked on, on uh, body sculpture together. And when people see the piece, they naturally could jump to the conclusion that it's been built by the technologist that you mention. But knowing you as I do and having watched the performance of body sculpture, it's entirely evident that you are finding some form of uh, verging between the choreographer, the musician, uh, using your, uh, your code like a synthesizer, yeah. uh, in some ways the way that the early automata engineers of the 17th, 18th century would have found that merging of technology and art to create creations. Yeah. Um, they were sometimes criticized for playing God because they would be trying to emulate human life. Uh, and there is this extraordinary emergence of a, a new art form, a, a piece that, to me, when I, I mentioned when we finished watching the first performance, I've now seen it twice, uh, it was the finest piece of uh, performance choreography uh, that uh, I've ever seen in an art gallery. Can you speak to this multidisciplinary nature that you now have and how that has either emerged in your work or you've always known it has been there? You've just been waiting um, uh, for the right artist to come along and allow you to play that out to the full degree that you now have. Uh, I would say that a lot of the, the technological side of this is an enabling technology. And um, certainly since we worked together on Female Figure, I think Jordan, he's aware that it is possible to make something that has a level of expression that, that, can, that can meet his expectations. And for me, when I built the cube, when I designed and built the cube, I was designing it and building it to have uh, a, a very broad range of expressive capabilities. And it's funny, because we're talking about a box, a faceless box with, with sort of plain arms coming out of it. But it has these sublime hands. It has this sublime ability to, to uh, gesture and to evoke emotion. Even, even though it's this very simple structural thing. There's a lot about it um, that draws upon, I would say, training that I've had in my career. So I've built and competed with robots at BattleBots, um, and they take a beating, and the cube has taken a beating in its time. Um, there is a lot of work that I've done uh, specifically with hands, making mechanical hands. I've made a lot of expressive mechanical hands. The hands of the female figure are ex especially expressive. And I, oftentimes when people talk to me about that or ask me questions about female figure, they're asking about the hands. And the hands are, are crucial to this. Um, I would even say, uh, maybe jumping ahead, the, the creation of the cube, the process of coming up with that, when I first uh, met with Jordan about the project, he had a small model of it, and the basic concept, everything was there. It was a box, there were arms coming out, it had little mechanical arms, little mechanical hands, and it wasn't really clear how big it should be, and the initial designs or the initial uh, mock-ups that he had built were huge. One of them was like, like this big, and so I said, okay, here's what I think we're going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to build the hands first. I'm going to build the hands, I'm going to put is that better? I'm going to put the hands 
in the sweet spot, engineering-wise, of the, the, the right motors, the right materials, scale the hands to be the best that they could possibly be, and then scale the whole rest of the cube to that. So the proportions are human. It has proportionally from wrist to elbow, from elbow to shoulder, from shoulder to shoulder. These are all natural human proportions. And it fits inside the cube. So the cube is sort of around a, a humanoid torso. And the hands are a little big. They're a little big the way uh, Michelangelo's David hands are a little big. They're a little big the way Boris Karloff's hands seem a little big, you know, as Frankenstein. Um, and that part of it actually went very smoothly. We, we got the cube built, and at that point, it was an instrument, and it was start to, time to start riffing on it. The, the hands, well, let's dwell on those a little bit further. The, I, I called it more human than human, because you've created hands that defy even the extraordinary agility of the Balinese dancer or the Chinese tea ceremony skill where the fingers have been trained to bend further than any hands should humanly bend. But at some point in the performance, we're surprised by the hands actually taking on an otherworldly, almost alien quality. But as we have, it, you described it almost as if you are dreaming what hands can achieve. <laughs> because it's everything that we wish that our bodies could do in the manner that us mere mortals may view a contortionist, go, wow, that can actually be achieved with the human body. I can't, but someone can. But you've taken it even further than that, where the digits, yeah. and, and to some degree a parlor trick, because you're using technology to do things that the human body can't do, but in that, there's a prestige. There, there is a piece of uh, magician's slight, you know, smoke and mirror, sleight of hand. So to speak. So, so to speak. <laughs> um, elevate that a little bit for the audience. Sure. Because it is very special. Well, it's an interesting thing. You know, there, there are many concepts within the, the body sculpture uh, project. And one of them was that the cube has no front or back or top or bottom or even left or right. And the hands actually are, are symmetrical, ambidextrous, which is to say that they can, they can bend in either direction. And we only really encounter that in, in moments in the piece. But in those moments, we see that the, that the fingers can, can hyperextend, they can bend backwards. And when that moment happens, I feel it as I'm watching it. It's like I feel my fingers uh, because I'm empathizing with the, with the cube this whole time. And it's almost like my, my fingers are turning into snakes and it's like, it's like this dream, you know, it's like I dreamt that my fingers were, were, were like tentacles. And, and then you, you see that, and I, I feel it in my fingers when that, when that moment happens. Um, but it, it is a moment that starts with a, a sort of anatomical hyperextension, but then it goes beyond that. And when you consider that, it's evident that your medium of art is motion. The ability to manipulate motion in the way that a director may choreograph a contemporary dancer. And I call out contemporary dancer as opposed to, say, a more classical ballet dancer who may still bring a superior level of skill to their dance, but it is, it is disciplined around a preordained set of moves that are right for that particular piece of music. A contemporary dancer is able to intuitively adjust as they flow through it. Yeah. And to me, when I watch uh, body sculpture, it is entirely evident that you have allowed the contemporary dance qualities of your choreography to come very strongly into this. The motion that you've chosen to master has fuzzy logic in it. There's even a component in the piece, which is the chain, which a chain is a very interesting thing if you stop to think about it. It has completely um, uh, uh, discourse and, and lack of order, but under tension becomes a steel bar with incredible control and stiffness. And when you see the way that you have manipulated these components through the choreography of the programming that you've done and the art that you've brought to it, 
there is a um, very unique set of uh, processes going on. I think and this is a, actually a good moment to, if you're talking about the chain, I want to just take a step back and address what you're saying about the choreography, because one of the things that I think is unique about um, this project and also my working relationship with Jordan is the control system that I developed to create the content. And I want to explain it in this way. Um, I'm accustomed to working in the film industry and film and television is an edited medium. We have a moment, a shot begins, an action occurs, the action concludes, the shot cuts, we now cut to a different viewpoint and this, these things can be edited together. The experience of seeing female figure or the experience of seeing colored sculpture or the experience of seeing body sculpture is not that. It is, it is a, a, a moment where you can walk into a space and experience something continuously. Creating the content for these pieces has to be a nonlinear process. So basically what I've done is I have made a kind of music software. So I'm, uh, my hobby is electronic music, I'm a musician, um, and music and sound and motion and dance informs my approach to robotics. So when Jordan and I are working on animation, when we get together and we start to work on um, a scene or a moment, we have an idea, we are actually playing the cube like it's a musical instrument. So my software, I call it the motion synthesizer. And a synthesizer in, for music is a thing, you know, you walk up to it and you turn the knobs and you get a really great sound and you play with it and it's very fun and interactive and then you save that and you make another one. So operating the cube is like that. It's a synthesizer that synthesizes motion. And I'm actually gonna use the drum scene as an example. So when we were working with uh, the percussionist, Eli Kessler, on the drum scene, the cube plays itself, it, it taps. It taps and drums on its surface. Um, there is a musical instrument called a cajon, which is actually a box, and you can sit on this box and you can, you can play this thing and play rhythms on it. You can do the same thing with the cube. The front face of it is designed to be a resonant panel, so you can find different resonant tonalities on it. And so Eli and I would play this thing, and, and Eli would, would sample the sound, digitally sample the sound that the cube would make, and then he would run that into his computer and compose something and then give me the audio file, and I would take that. And so when I program a motion for the cube, I'm not linearly programming a motion that begins here and then it occurs and then it ends over here. I'm programming a moment in time. So I'll have a kind of a loop going. And so the cube is tapping on itself. It's doing this gesture. And I start working on this repeated gesture. And I work on the moment that it strikes the cube. I work on what is the, what is the trajectory of the hand? What are its motions as it's out in space and then coming back and touching the cube again? And I have a metronome running. And I adjust it until it's perfectly in time with the metronome. Now this repeating gesture in the context of the piece may occur once. So you don't perceive it as a repeating gesture, but it was created as a repeating gesture. And I can take these moments and I can have them repeat twice, I can have it happen, and I can have a different thing happen, and I can switch them around. And so Jordan and I can riff on these things and we can jam on these, these ideas. We can create content very, very quickly and then very quickly tear it up, put it back together, change the order, change the tempo, change the speed. Um, and in this way, the cube is literally a musical instrument and also can be, can be riffed on like we're two musicians having a jam session. And to that end, what I could see very clearly when I walked in, and once again, it's something that I said to you immediately having watched it, is the restraint that is in the piece. I'm very aware of what the robotics that you've built could have achieved. And I now, having spent some time with Jordan, could imagine the desire to be highly extrovert in the piece, have the piece be showy, have it be uh, flashy, if you like. But it isn't. Yeah. It's its restraint, is its, is its humanness, is its yeah. um, refinement and to me a great part of its beauty. Uh, 
what, what is the thought process that you're using to not allow yourself to run off and sort of glorify in your own... Oh, we do. We do run off. We run in every direction. We, we, run, we run down every rabbit hole. We, we go too far. We go too far. And in developing the material, in developing the choreography, we take every idea and we take it way too far. To the point of breakage in some Sometimes, cases? Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Um, I like to say that with... Uh, with Metaphorically my and physically. Well, I, yeah. you know, I, I, I try to have happy accidents, you know, when we're working on it. And um, we also sometimes have unhappy accidents. But in, in taking it too far, we then pull back. And I often say to my colleagues when I'm working on something um, mechanical or structural, I say, okay, show me too much so I know what enough is. And it's similar in working, working, on, working with Jordan on this piece. We, we take everything way too far. And it's really Jordan's intuition that then reels it all in. It's like, okay, this, this is pure. This is true. We're going to use that. There's truth here. We're going to use that. And everything else is superfluous. And that truth at times comes through in the form of a sensuousness. It can. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, it's sensuous to the point that a lover might appreciate from a partner. Uh, you're not a voyeuristic individual. You're not uh, uh, appear to be extrovert in your expression of emotion. Yet <laughs> within the cube, it is. Yeah. How how do you find that? It's it, you just have to really be um, honest. Honest. And it's um, you know it, there's there's a, a little bit of um, uh, autobiographical content in the piece that is, it's just, you know, uh, when we were working on the sensuality scene or the assault scene, as it also is also known, um, we actually had a sex therapist come in and look at what we were doing. And it was really interesting because he was a little taken aback at first, wasn't really sure what to, what to make of it all. Um, what, uh, the, the note that I got from it, which I actually used, is that people tend to have a dominant hand, mm -hmm. and so the symmetry of that scene was influenced a bit by that content, co concept. Um, that, was, that was about it uh, f for the, the input from that, that person, but the, the sensuality of that scene, you just have to be truthful with yourself and, um, and, 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 and just let it, let it be what it is. And it's so nuanced. Yeah. When, when one hand starts actually stroking the other hand, removes itself from the body as such, and actually starts touching the opposing hand, there's now something almost motherly in that, and uh, it, it breaks free of being purely sensual as one lover to another and actually becomes uh, caring. And there's this... Uh, it's a kind of self-care. Yeah, yeah self-care. There's this incredible nuance. And that's obviously setting us up for a later scene where there is a destructive quality. There is an, an annihilistic sense to the cube, yeah. which, which is deeply disturbing because you've been lulled into the sense that it is deeply caring, self-appreciating, and yet it can... Um, be quite uh, duplicitous in its in its performance. Yeah, there are a number of contradictions in the piece, and as a, as both uh, someone who's creating content for it, but also as the person who created the physical cube itself, the dynamic range of what it does mechanically from these really delicate moments where it's it's in contact with itself or it's in contact with the floor to other moments where it's actually hitting itself as hard as it can. Uh, that was a real challenge. That was a yeah. that was a challenge, a technical challenge, um, but uh, but it it worked. It was a rewarding result. Let's jump to a, a different uh, uh, area of, to discuss. It is faceless, <laughs> yet it has a face. Yeah, it's uncanny. Yeah, uh, it is headless, yet there is a face where a face shouldn't be. And uh, while I was watching it, I was taking notes, and uh, I drew a Rorschach pattern hmm. from, the, uh, from the abuse, from the rubbing, from the subtlety on the chest or on the front face. See, I'm immediately uh, humanizing it on, on the front face of the cube. 
And uh, I found a face in it. It was a demonic face. <laughs> I, I showed it to Mark, and Mark was of the view best not to pop that on the screen. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but we all see something different. Yeah, right? a so, face all yeah. the same. And it w the reason it wasn't appropriate to put the drawing on the screen is it would have put my perception of the raw shack into it. And it's lovely if you all see the raw shack yourself. And of course, as days turn into weeks, weeks they turn into months, and more abrasiveness happens between the hand and the aluminium, or aluminium, uh, uh, as you would call it, we're going to see an emergence of more of a face and different faces. Yeah. This wasn't accidental, was it? No, no, no. The way that the the material itself and the way the materials interact with each other and the way the um, these markings appear on the aluminum, it's uh, something that we embraced. And the, uh, the wear that occurs on the fingertips, it's something that we embrace. We don't fight that. We don't try to keep that from happening. We're not trying to clean it up. Yeah, it's interesting seeing the photographs and... Uh uh, how the original robot was so clean, mm -hmm. as it's going to be, because it's a manufacturer object coming out of 3D printers, milling machines, commercially purchased servos from the Dynamixel company, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, Jordan has allowed it to grow old. He's allowed it to get the detritus of life attached to it. Yes. Was that how did that evolve, and was that? very much the hope or is N no not necessarily the um you've seen pictures of it when it looks yeah. very very clean and fresh all of the markings all of the scars on the arms those all occurred organically as we were creating the motion of the cube and i mentioned the happy and unhappy accidents that would occur um that that is that is 100 percent legitimate all of these things that you see on the on the, the cube occurred in real time occurred in its evolution as, a, as an object. And I find, and I think Jordan agrees, I find it uh, heartbreakingly beautiful. Yeah, you know? it brings a beautiful patination of life. The way you might drive past a bronze statue on a bridge in Paris, yet the oxidization that has happened over hundreds of years has bring, brought a unique quality, an elemental quality to it yeah. that the artist never imagined. And, and I get a sense that that's what's the beauty in it. Yeah. And very, very, very exquisite. Um, you asked me what was my reaction. Yes. And you asked if I would talk to that. Uh, my first thought and the first note I wrote down was I wrote the word propaganda, both <laughs> seductive and destructive, <laughs> right? In the manner that propaganda is written to be highly seductive, but ultimately and almost always ends up being destructive. The, the, the cube, to me, caused me such a, um abrupt reaction in its ability to speak outwardly. Initially, when I walked into the room, I positioned myself on the far uh, left because I wanted to look at the mechanism. I couldn't help but <laughs> immediately want to analyze how it had been built. But halfway through the performance, I realized that there is a cone of influence coming out of the cube where the cube is actually, at times it encompasses the room by its very gesture. But a great deal of the time, it is frontward facing and desiring to engage with a cone of influence. And so I moved directly into the very middle of it and suddenly it was speaking to me <laughs> in a very emotional way. And uh, yesterday, my two colleagues who are with me, uh, Zoilo and Cam, who are both roboticists, uh, they went into the space. And I watched them very closely. I was watching the cube, and I was obviously watching their reaction. And it was really lovely to watch uh, Zoilo do exactly as I had done. He started off on the left, and he centered himself eventually right down the middle of the sculpture. And uh, Cam kept throwing glances over to me and sort of doing this, uh, you know, as, as I watched his understanding of the piece evolve. And Jordan has arguably created a piece of art that no individual 
will take away the same reaction as the other. Now, you could say that about any piece of art, because all art is nuanced. But because of the complex set of components and performance capabilities and the underlying content that's been expressed, I can't imagine that should a family visit and get back in their car to drive home, all four would uh, come to the same conclusion around what was the intent, what did I get out of it, who was this character that I just met. I would imagine that there are going to be wonderful and warm debates around what individuals got out of it. And now that the three of us, my colleagues and I, have seen it, that's been the primary conversation that we've had, which is, but what did you see in it? What did you take out of it? What did you... So Jordan has evoked this uh, amazing desire to look more deeply than one may look. And it's been done with in such a sublime way, such a... Um, a manner in which that people would immediately assume that the technologists behind it worked with uh, the, the mechanics of robotics. But you're very much creating the organic quality of a human in many ways, the muscles, the veins, the flowing of the energy, the dexterity, the sense of touch, the sense of feeling. and. Uh, in turn, breathing life into an otherwise inert object. That's the, that's the central core of my career mm. from, from the very early days. Um, uh, I would call myself a puppeteer at the start of my career, and uh, I call myself a roboticist now, but it's the same thing. It's bringing, it's bringing life to this inanimate vessel. And I was asked recently, um, in layman's terms, what is, the, what is the cube? And I would say it's, it is, it's like a being. It has bones, it has muscles, it has veins, it has uh, nerves. You know, the, the aluminum and the carbon fiber, that's, the, that's the, the, the bones, that's the structure of it. It has motors, which are the muscle. It has electricity coursing through its wires. That's the, that's the lifeblood, and it has signals passing through. And it is... Uh, it is practically alive. Does it have intelligence? Well, to some extent it does. Um, the system, uh, I've mentioned my own control system, which I used to create the content of the piece. There's another control system, which is uh, the overdrive system, which is basically the overarching system that controls the whole thing. And when you go into the space, you may notice that there are a, a lot of little cameras and things like that all around. And you mentioned a few minutes ago about the chain. So the chain is one of the sources of chaos yes. in the piece. Another source of chaos is the, the cube is on the floor, and when it's doing this, this, this assault scene, sometimes it creeps all the way out to the edge of the stage. Sometimes it goes backwards. And I've noticed that during that scene, the robot arm will actually follow it around because it has to be in the right spot at the right time. So the system is, in fact, interactive to itself. It's interactive in the sense that it has to adapt to the chaos that's occurring on the stage. And the piece isn't really about uh, a lot of violent things occurring. Yes, violent things occur. The chain scene is a, a very, which uh, Ted Marchant is the, the, the artist that created that, that incredibly violent moment. Um, sometimes the chain whips around and it moves the cube. And that was the first, the first performance that you saw yep. had that happen. And the, uh, the system has to adapt. It has to adapt to that. So it, there is actually a little bit of intelligence going on there um, in as much as you don't just press play and walk out of the room. It's, it's much, much more involved than that. Yeah, what Mark's referring to is the first night we watched it. And this is in front of 70 guests, all the bigwigs here at the uh, art gallery. Uh, and invited guests that represent Jordan from uh, across the world. And the robot didn't quite grab the chain. But rather than that being a disappointing component or, or a letdown, it was completely the opposite because it immediately gave the, the, the character, uh, it immediately stopped it uh, ever been a robot, and it was a character on the stage, and it was the frailty of the human 
machine. That that uh, you know, if if the term uh, the ghost in the machine at that moment, I felt the ghost in the machine. It was amazing, and I actually felt privileged that I had seen a performance where the uh, the pincer didn't quite grab the chain as I saw yesterday, where it worked arguably what would be considered perfectly, but the imperfection of it missing the chain just. It, it sent a shudder down my spine, and when we were talking about it earlier, I, I, I had the same shudder, and I, I even mentioned it to Mark, because I was like, wow, that, that is so uh, metaphorically of when we all trip, when we all make those mistakes, when we believe that we've trained ourselves well, but, but fumble and fall, and I really enjoyed that as a component of that particular performance. I like it better when it works perfectly. Of but, course. <laughs> but uh, but it, that was cool too. That was cool too. Um, but uh, in many ways, we do embrace imperfection. And one of the ways that uh, that we can create motion for the cube. This is actually kind of fun. Um, there was some. Uh, discussion early on uh, if we should make a Waldo controller for the cube and the Waldo controller is basically a machine that you can grab onto and move around and if you've been downstairs in the gallery that's before uh, gallery 16 there's a video there there's a couple of examples of, of that so you can see what that looks like but what we finally decided to do was to use the cube as a controller for itself and what that means is you can you can let the cube relax, and then you can wrestle it into a position. You can wrestle it into a, into a pose where it's in whatever form you want, really, and then you can capture that. And so the cube can then go to those poses that you've created. Those poses, however, are oftentimes kind of gnarled, because you know, Jordan and I kind of together, we wrestle the cube into a position. It's like, OK, wait, no, the, the hand is like, oh, don't worry about it. Just, just capture the pose. We capture the pose, and then later on, I'll, I'll clean it up. Um, uh, my, my sister, Mary Citrakian, is a uh, singer, and she's a voice teacher, and she teaches actors to sing, and she teaches singers to act. And my takeaway from her, from her teachings, is the phrase, don't clean up. Don't clean it up. And I think about that, because I'll be working on a pose, and I'll be like, okay, well, I've got to fix this, I've got to like, take, take that out, smooth this over here, and before you know it, you've sucked all the life out of the, out of the thing. And so, many times, we have, and there's some like, key moments in, in body sculpture where there's this, this gnarled thing occurred, but then I take that gnarled thing and I mirror it to the other side, and now it becomes a Rorschach, and now it becomes, it becomes a face, or it becomes a symbol, or it becomes something we don't even know what it is, but, it makes, but you feel it, and in those moments, that's an accidental piece. I didn't clean it up. It's perfect. We're using it just like that. I love the fact that the Rorschach doesn't even need to be drawn onto the face. The hands are actually it, doing it, it can trace it in space, yeah. yeah. And you're actually watching it uh, pictographically build a picture in front of you. Sure. Yeah. It's the deliberate use of symmetry and then asymmetry. Yeah. Um, that's a recurring theme. Uh, there's, there's actually both symmetry and asymmetry in the image that you're seeing here. Uh, this is one of my favorite poses. This is a pose that, that Jordan presented to me. Uh, it was a photograph of a child, and um, I recreated it perfectly. And that, to me, uh, I, I see the child. Yeah, it's glee. Ex expressing to joy. Me, it's utter glee yeah, that the child has that, that adults struggle to ever find again. Yeah. And you got that. Mm. Yeah, when you yeah. saw the piece. Yeah. Question time, we'll yeah. need to jump to yeah, that. Yeah, let's but, do that. I would love to have uh, some questions for There's the a lovely question here. A lot of Weta's work is drawn on the ecology of Aotearoa, and Mark joked about pets and owners. How do you see the relationship between the evolved and the engineered? Huh. I think that's a question for you, Richard. <laughs> uh, well, uh, let's work to the second question and fold that one into it. What? what what technology do you wish was more advanced? And where do you hit the limits of what's possible right now? Well, that's easy. Because that speaks to, you know, because of course we all want to see engineer. well, we would like to see engineering be more ev evolved and more organic. It is restricted at the moment by what is technically possible, but there are moves afoot in the world uh, to introduce certain components of programming and engineering that
that allows uh, the ecology of, of the evolved to take on a more superior level of, um, of capability. But I mean, would I mean sometimes I, when I'm trying to build a robot, I feel like I'm banging two rocks together. Um, one of the misconceptions that um, many lay people have about robots is that they're super strong. Robots are super strong. And we see images of robots like in factories picking up cars and waving them around, and that's really true. But pound for pound, a human being is 10 times stronger than a robot. And I would really like to see uh, advances in motor technology um, or the technology of, of basically making these robots more organic, you know, tools that allow us to make them closer to the way we're made. I, I do a lot of work in China. I work in a manufacturing facility up there quite a lot. And I said to my business partner, who's Chinese, about 15 years ago, why don't you start implementing robots to do some of the mass reproduction work? And he said, why? Why would I do that when I have access to millions and millions of cost-effective, incredibly superior robots in the form of human workforce? And it caused me to stop and reflect for a moment on the, the point. Uh, yeah which was uh, it takes a lot to become more superior than what we can achieve Absolutely. as people. Yeah, I, we're, not as far, we're not as far along with robotics as most people think we are. And um, there's a question here, Mark. Did yeah. you study human anatomy to help create the movements, ID tendons and muscles triggered by synapses, mirrored by strings and electronic impulses? Yes, constantly. I'm, I'm always um, studying, studying anatomy, studying the way that the human body works and uh, looking for ways to imitate that. I can't duplicate it, but I can, I can imitate it. One of the ways, actually, that, that I do that is um, I, I try to avoid using perfect right angles and perfect parallel planes and things. Um, one of the keys to making expressive hands is that nothing is in line with yes. itself. And actually, these hands, um, it's subtle, but the fingers are not straight, and each finger is different. They're not the same length. They're not, they don't actually follow a straight line. Um, the, the main compromise of them is that they're perfectly planar down the center, so they have that hyperextension in both directions. But there are all these little imperfections that, that are key to making them work. Indeed. It's a mistake you immediately see. I teach sculpting to young people at work and how they have perceived the hand to be entirely symmetrical. And it's obvious that the, thing, the digits are of different lengths. But the palm sets the status of each finger and the throw of each finger and the curl of each finger and the fact that you lead by the pinky, et cetera, et cetera. Things that people that just don't think about but is so evident even in this piece of video that's playing right now. Uh, Mark, can you tell us more about the happy accident? Sure, here's a quick one. So um, the, the thing I mentioned earlier about the process of uh, manually wrestling the cube into a pose and then capturing that pose. That is the source of many uh, happy accidents. An unhappy accident would be where I decide to put the robot into a pose and then unwittingly crash the hands into each other, which has, which has happened a few times. So that's the unhappy part. There's a lovely question here. Uh, body sculpture is at the cutting edge of robotics. Can you speak to the role of artists in driving innovation. I would like to speak to that. So um, there's a really interesting phenomena. Um, do you know Dave Kinlan? I think maybe you do. So Dave is a, a creature mechanic, and he had a theory that there were multiple parallel histories of robotics, that there's the history of academic robotics, there's the history of industrial robotics, there's the history of animatronics, AKA uh, Disney Imagineering, then there's the, hes the history of creature mechanics, which is Rick Baker, um, you know, Carlo Rambaldi, the, the Hensons, your company, uh, creating things for cinema. And in, in no cases for decades have these paths crossed at all. But now we're starting to see, um, and I'm gonna use an example, the, uh, the recent little droids that have appeared at uh, Galaxy's Edge in, yes. at, at Disneyland. Yeah. So what they're finally doing is the academic side, which has uh, accomplished walking, stable walking on uneven surfaces. So we have little bipedal robots that can walk around. They've converged with Disney animators who are now putting in all this great character, all this great you know, nuance, and they've blended them together in an incredibly effective way. 
And that, that's very exciting to me because we're, we're finally starting to see some cross-pollinization cross and some cross-synergy between these previously um, separated technological lines. Uh, there's a question here. Would you be able to shake hands with the robot's hand? Yeah. No. Your anxiousness is because of the, the, the risk of the grip damaging the human's hand? No, um, it's, it plays, it, I, I'm, not, I'm not too worried about it, but it, it does speak to the fact that people are stronger than robots. And even, even the cube, although it is a, a mighty uh, robot in many ways, it's at the edge of its capabilities most of the time. And yes, you could absolutely uh, shake hands with the robot. I would like it to have um, maybe more sensing before I would do that, yes. so that it could it could very dynamically adapt to to touch. There is a different touch. way to put the question: Is it capable to build a robot's hand like uh, a body sculpture that you could shake? Yes, and abso indeed, there absolutely. absolutely is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there was a question that's just dropped off the bottom, if you could please move it. Both of you have a ton of experience working with teams of artists. Can you speak to how you recruit and support these sculptors and engineers? I might just touch on that one mm. uh, for Mark. Uh, I always list an order of importance, passion, enthusiasm, tenacity, and then talent. People perceive that talent must surely be the key to open uh, the golden locker. It isn't. Uh, if you don't... Uh, have a unabashed passion to do what you desire to do and enthusiasm to drive that passion forward and a stickability that comes through tenacity, you're going to lack vital ingredients that will uh, mean that you can fulfill our clients' needs and go on the journey with your colleagues. Um, I like to think that everything goes back to Beatrix Potter. You just have to be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed <laughs> like Squirrel Nutkin. We're both veterans of what we do. You look at Mark. Mark is speaking with an unadulterated passion about what he does. There's no sense of jaded fatigue. This is enthralling, engaging, and beautiful every single day. I can't wait to get to work every morning, and I've been doing it for 35 years because I'm in love with what I do, and I simply put it down to four tenets. Um, love of yourself, love of what you do, love of who you do it with, and love of who you do it for. Irrelevant to whether you're talking of your professional life or your personal life, if you can hit those four tenets, it's almost certain that you're going to find a rewarding journey through your life. And so we are looking for people that aspire to fulfill those four. Here, here. Um, <laughs> What do you think the world will look like in 2050? Hmm. Philosophically, Mark? Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping that it looks a lot... Uh, I'm hoping that, that human beings are still the, the, the focus of, of our, uh, our daily lives. Um, I think that robots are going to become a thing. I think that AI is going to become a thing. And I hope that that leads to um, uh, more humanity, not less. And... And indeed, uh, here, here to that. At some point, the complex technology and programming that brings the sculpture life may be obsolete. How do you feel about the artwork reaching end of life? Well, I, I don't worry about that so much because the piece is the piece. And it's really, um, uh, we have conservation here in the, in the building today with us. Um, it's how do, you, how do you preserve it? And what are the important things about it? So the important things are the performance of the content. Um, in the future, we may have different motors. In the future, we may have different computers. We may have different ways of, of actualizing the content. Um, I'm going to be doing some, uh, I'm going to be taking female figure to the beauty parlor and tuning, tuning her up a bit. Um, that's going to be uh, some modern motors, because even in the 10 years that have passed since female figure was created, some of those components are obsolete and they are no longer available. Yep. So what's important is the uh, uniform fidelity of the, of the performance. It doesn't matter to me what motor is inside. What matters is that the, the work is presented identically to the way it was presented before. I don't really care what technology is behind the mirror. I don't care what technology is inside. I want the, the content 
to be presented correctly. Make, and make so, yeah, we, yeah. You know, we have to work around that. Yeah. Great, great. Uh, and to that end, someone's just written in this question. I must say these are really delightful questions. Are you thinking of providing tactile feedback or visual input from human action may be linked to AI to extend from planned choreography? Maybe not even on body sculpt, but just in general with your own body of work. Yeah, for sure. Um, not not for, for body sculpture, but, um, but we are... Um, I and uh, certainly Jordan as well are really interested in developments in AI and what ways those tools could be used to create something new. Absolutely. Um, do you see these hands potentially being able to play a musical instrument, say a guitar? Um, hand, it, not these hands, but yes, hands like these could play a guitar. Mm -hmm. um, and. What these ones would do would be like sort of Eddie Van Halen style, like hammer, hammer on, yeah. you know, finger tapping. Yeah. So uh, you've, you've spoken about, about uh, there we go, um, programming the movements, but could you also talk about the formal housing elements, the shape of the fingertips, etc.? So one of the things that I do uh, mechanically is, and also in software, is I try to compartmentalize certain things. So the fingertips, I'm going to get into the weeds here, folks, sorry. Uh, the fingertips have a, a figure of eight cable so that the middle joint and the tip joint are, are linked to each other. And I've mechanically separated within the housing of the fingertip, there is a spindle, and so you tension the, the cables with one action, and then you rotate the spindle to center the fingertip as a second action. And so the housings, the fingertips, they are serving a dual purpose. The material that they're made of is ideal to create a certain resonant tap on the surface of the cube. They're durable enough that they can handle being rubbed on the floor over and over again and rubbed on the surface. Um, they're hollow, they have mechanical components inside them, and the, the whole thing is this highly integrated system. So the, the housing plays a role in the overall function of the, the hand. The housing of the fingertips plays a role in the overall functioning of the finger. It's all, it's, it's extremely intricately uh, interconnected. And shall we finish last question with a very philosophical question someone's asked here. If the character has these qualities of intelligence, should it have a quality of responsibility for its actions? Hmm. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think? You know, yes or no? Should the cube be held accountable for its actions? Yes? By applause? No, it should not be held accountable for its actions. Good, so good, the first, good on you. Uh, the I, first question, because it is a very philosophical question a lot of people are asking. Some will visit the cube and choose to demonize the technology behind it because of the fear of emerging robotics and AI. So this is a very um, sound question to ask. So applause for the desire for it to have responsibility for its actions. Crickets. Great. And so therefore, we all agree that it needn't bother having... It is not responsible for its actions. It is not responsible for its actions. It all sits on Jordan and Mark's yep. shoulders. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. So by that, that's by way of us coming to an end of our session. Remember that Jordan is speaking later today. At 2 uh, o'clock. At 2 o'clock. You have an opportunity to see... Uh, body sculpture at one o'clock. Uh, I think uh, we all could agree that this has been a delightful uh, talk with Mark. Uh, what you've witnessed is someone that is operating at the very apex of multiple uh, technology and creative components of the world's uh, uh, areas of expertise, uh, specifically choreography, music, performance and robotics and uh, I've felt very privileged hearing these answers that have come today. Thank you for your lovely questions and for your attendance and uh, sharing in this extraordinary moment. If it wasn't for Jordan, none of us would be here and if it wasn't for this incredible uh, art gallery that has chosen to, uh, to host this incredible artwork, none of us would be here. So a round of applause for Mark and all involved. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Cool. Wonderful. Thank you.